Um, if you haven't met me, my name is Felipe. Uh, I work for Citrix on the Zen, on the Zen Server Engineering Performance Team uh, with focus on storage performance. So I've been doing a lot of stuff with storage performance and there's only so much you can talk about in a 20-25 minutes talk. So what I wanted to talk about today is what I've been recently encountering and working with very low latency storage devices, so newer SSDs and, and things like that. So what happens in terms of the virtualization overhead when you're using this kind of storage? I'll then review very quickly how block from block back, block tap, QMU, block tap 3, Qt disk, etc. works in case you get confused with uh, the terminology. Um, and share some of my recent measurements uh, explaining how I've been measuring things today <clears throat> and talking about what we're doing to improve on that. So this is both on a Zen and a Zen server um, perspective. So one of the things that I come across a lot, and probably everyone who does do that, is when they, they first install uh, any kind of Zen environment and get a VM running, they would go into DOM0. So if you're familiar with Zen Center, this is Zen Center. Um, on a DOM0 console, and they're going to do some sort of DD and observe what kind of throughput they get. So it's a very simplistic test. And here you can see I'm reading at about 118 megabytes a second. And then you go and do the same thing in your VM. Um, and in this case, again, I got 117 megabytes a second, so it's all good, right? I can quit. <laughs> um, so it turns out it's not always like that. So what happens when some other people have different types of disks, and then in this case you go into DOM0 and you measure about um, almost 700 megabytes a second, and then you go to do a VM and you measure 300 megabytes a second. And of course people are going to argue, yeah, but in the aggregate it doesn't work like that, uh, it depends, you know, of course, but as I said, this is one use case. So let me go over very quickly how um, a storage request transverse, transverse the, um, the virtualization stack and um, then discuss some of my measurements. So as you know, there, is, um, there are many different ways a user application can do I.O. A very simple one is through uh, read and write. So if you have a user process and uh, you have a buffer and you have a file descriptor, in this example opened with uh, all direct so it bypasses any caching, and you do some read, that's going to go into a, a syscall handler, it's going to bounce around in the kernel for a bit, end up in the block layer, and then you're going to have a BIO placed in your request queue for, the, for your device. You kick the driver, the driver passes your, your request to the device, and eventually some hard interrupt will complete your request, and in the end your buffer has the data. So the, <clears throat> the most simple case with Zen is work out some of my animations magic. That works. We have a, when my manager saw that, he said, oh, that's what I'm paying you for, the PowerPoint <laughs> animations. <laughs> uh, what we do here in the, what we call the upstream Zen case, or, or what you get if you just install Zen, is we replace that device driver in the VM with something called block front, and we run something called block back in DOM0. And Blockback is going to pick up this request from Blockfront and pass them to the block layer and up in your device driver. So it's basically just that. In Zen Server, we do things a little bit different. And if you use QMU or QDisk, you might um, see something similar. Um, we, we have certain features like thin provisioning and cloning and snapshotting, which you support at the software stack. So what we do is basically store the data in, in VHD. But uh, Blockback doesn't talk VHD, so we in introduced a software component called TapDisk. And it got a little bit tricky because we cannot get the block layer to talk to a user space component like that. So um, what we did at the time, and this is just historically done like that, was to introduce a new component here called BlockTap2. So BlockTap2 provides a block device that Blockback can talk through, through the block layer, and BlockTap2 will talk to TapDisk. And then TapDisk will complete the requests through LibAO. Uh, 
So the data path is a little bit longer. Of course, there's a little bit of added latency here. But um, <clears throat> we, we can then work with, uh, with VHD and do storage migration and, and, and things like that using this model. So this has been historically done like that way before people started thinking about SSDs and other concerns with that. So there is uh, a slightly different use case, which is um, the one with, with QMUQ disk and TAPDIS3. And what we do there is we, we get rid of this and uh, we replace TAPDISC with QMU. The only difference here is actually that Q, QMU doesn't really use LibIO, uses POSIX IO, which is a little bit different. It's more portable um, and, and it has other differences. And uh, we, we get this user process to talk straight to Blockfront through the, the grand dev and the event channel device in order to, to, to do the grand mapping and, and um, and get interrupted and interrupt block from back. So, so that's about it. So um, to, to measure these things, what I did was to grab three different types of disks. So the first one you see there is this Dell. It's a, a Seagate SAS disk, a 15K RPM uh, enterprise class uh, hard drive. The second one is a Dell SSD, and the third one is an Intel DC SSD, which is pretty, pretty fast. And I grabbed two of each. I created three sets of RAID 0, put them into the same box. So I had three different uh, uh, volumes connected through a, a PERC H700. And um, I started to measure reading with, uh, um, while, while I was varying my, my block sizes, so here from, from one sector all the way to four megabytes in logarithm scale, and observing what kind of throughput would I get in megabytes a second, so here, um, Bigger is better. And what I could see is that the, for, while I was growing the blocks, the, the, the block size per associated per request into 32K, the throughput was about the same, up after which point I kind of reached the maximum throughput that those, um, the this, this SAS disks could offer, the mechanical disks could offer. And then you see the throughput doesn't change anymore, no matter how much I increase my requests. That's the blue line. So on the green line, those were the, the, the Dell SSDs, the one in the middle in the picture before. And you see they get faster up to 120K and then they drop. And what happens here is just that uh, the controller, the device driver for that controller actually, actually advertised the maximum request size as being 120K, 128K. So at that point, the block layer starts sending one request of 120K and another one, which is depending on what I was using here for another 4K, and then just splitting requests up. So the, the, that configuration was sensitive to this, uh, and that is the green line. And on the red line, which is the Intel SSDs, you would just carry on getting faster. There is a, a little bit of a bump there at 120K again, but less sensitive, and then you just carry it on. Um, so this is measured on top of Zen 4.3 on a CentOS 6.4 and, and the 3.11 kernel. So I'm gonna pick two of these, which is the blue line with the SAS disks, and the red line, which is the, the fast Intel disks, and compare them on the, uh, a virtualized perspective. So if you look at the blue line, and then I run a VM, so this was a Debian Wheezy VM um, with all the vCPUs pinned, so it's a very big box, but uh, I, I kept everything into the same Numa node. And I run uh, my measurements from, from the guest. What I see is that, that's the purple line here, all of them are slower up to just over, or just over 60 something, maybe just over 100K. At which point the throughput I get in the guest is the same. So this kind of matches what you saw on those first two slides when I was doing DD from Zen Center. And we measure something with one megabyte block sizes in DOM0, we measure again in the VM, we don't see any overhead. <coughs> so this is, this is the graph, the, 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 the plot that tells you exactly why. If I add measurements from a, from a disk that has been, oh, so here this disk has been plugged using Blockfront 3.2.0. So the difference here, they didn't use the 3.11, is because the 3.11 has persistent grants implemented. I'll talk about that a little bit later. So I just wanted to simplify what we would, would normally see. And um, it was blocked back, plugged directly to the block layer. So it was what I was describing as the upstream Zen case. If I plug um, more disks to this VM, uh, through, Q, through tap disk 2 and block tap, and through um, QDisk, what, uh, what we see is that the throughput doesn't really get that far, that doesn't really get that high. So we, we never really match the, um, 
the throughput we were observing either with blockback or with um, or, uh, or with bare metal or even from DOM0. Uh, there are many reasons for this. There's uh, some CPU overhead here. There's the longer data path. There, there were some added times. I'll, I'll talk about that later as well, why, why this happens. So this is um, what happens in this configuration using those SAS disks. Now I will show you what happens if this was the being measured on top of the Intel SSDs, which is the red line now. So you see that Blockback was sensitive as well to that, to that bump at 120k. But even Blockback is enabled to, to actually be fast enough to match the SSDs. So if someone actually sets up this configuration on, or, or a similar class of a very fast enterprise storage and, and try Blockback directly or, or some user space alternative, they're going to see a massive performance hit. And um, I can even flick between the slides and you can see how the um, the block back and the user space doesn't really any, get any faster at that point, but the, um, the SSDs can just go faster. Um, so the, the problem now is to understand what actually is going on. Why is it not faster, right? Where are those, those, um, those bottlenecks and, and what can we do about them? So what I decided to do is stop looking at this um, in terms of throughput. And throughput, as you know, is just the amount of data it can pass in, in a fixed amount of time. Now, if we invert that, what we get is the amount of time it takes to pass a certain amount of data. And if, we, if we're passing just a small amount of or, or a very size of, of data to the guest and back and, and not send anything parallel, not break up requests, we can actually measure the time it is taking for the data to travel around and try to work out where things are getting slow. So if I plot a portion of that same graph as before, um, and here the colors have changed and the scales have changed. So just to show you, the, I'm just varying in linear scale up to 128K, uh, measuring at every 4K. And on the y-axis now, I have the, the latency it takes to serve those requests. So now lower is better. I can see that from DOM0, I can serve requests pretty, pretty fast. Maybe this was maybe 50 microseconds in the beginning with very small requests and then up to uh, just over 100 microseconds. And then what happens with uh, Blockback, you can even see that glitch at 120k in the end, and what's happened with my user space alternatives. So um, now we can see, oh, this is how much slower it actually is to, to serve a request of that particular size. So what we need to try to work out is how much time I'm losing on each one of these uh, stages. What, what am I doing during those 50 microseconds? Um, and on what am I doing on, on that three, four hundred microseconds that is taking so much longer. So what I did is to uh, start inserting trace points during the, the, the path, the code path that serves that, those requests using our DTSC. So this basically measures um, a fixed constant with a timestamp counter <laughs> that is consistent across cores. So I can get that from, from different domains and, and I have a, a, a solid reading on how much time has passed between, two, two, between that, the code, that particular piece of code being executed. And um, I, I observed a few things. So I observed that there, if, if you're just passing lots of requests, the first ones you pass are usually slower. So you need to, to use some sort of technique to debug this in which, or to trace this in which you can um, pass lots of requests and see what happens after the, the hot path is actually warmed up. Uh, to do that, I used uh, trace print K so I could just put everything into a trace buffer in the kernel and then uh, look in the bug of fast for the, for the actual timestamps that I've read. And in the user space, so within the application that I was reading from, and if I was using something like tap disk or block that or Q disk, in the user space, I just m made a big static buffer and put all my TSC readings in there. When I was done, I just sent a signal for it to print them out. So I didn't want to be printing them while in the hot path, otherwise I would add overhead to that. And uh, I actually confirmed that with my timestamps in there, uh, I confirmed that to the, to the other measurements that didn't have any timestamps inside, uh, and they were pretty much equivalent, so I knew I was not adding any, any sort of overhead by measuring in this way. And I would run 100 requests through, um, sequentially reading all of them, and uh, using IODF1, so I was not having requests piping uh, themselves up. Um, 
I looked at all the times, sorted them out, eliminated the fast and the slowest ones, and just averaged out the, the, the actual time for those middle 80 uh, requests that got served. And I repeated this 10 times. And by repeating it 10 times, I actually saw some interesting things, like sometimes you start this, this burst of, of 100 requests, and you notice that Blockback is being scheduled in a particular CPU or, or a particular vCPU of that range that was pinned, but you observe some, some difference into the, the, the affinity of, of where requests are going through and from. Um, of course, when there was anything a little bit weird, I could go back to the raw data before cutting anything out and, and trying to investigate what was going on. And um, let me show you where I was putting those traces. So if you remember this path for Blockback, uh, I started putting traces everywhere on the path where the request is actually going all the way through. So I can measure things like the latency of the context switching or the latency of the, um, of the event channel, uh, the latency to schedule the, the, the K thread for block back, et cetera, to the point where I send the request to block layer. And then I could measure everything else back when the request was actually completing all the way back to my application again. So you can look at the slides later and look at these 12 data points there. And um, I could actually plot that. So this, all of these lines correspond to, to those points you saw before. And what we see here is that this big orange line is the actual time that we spent in the device. So, um, and the other lines where we spent doing everything else to get the request in there and then back. Now, um, if you want to have a look at the raw data later, I can share that with you. You can go into the, and, and examine if there is any minimal optimization in here that can be done. I think the most important points to raise from there are the, are the actual times that we spend in the grant mapping and the grant and mapping, um, which are the two lines, the brown with the triangle and the other one with the, with the cross, um, second and third to the top one. Um, this now has been measured on 3.11, but we disabled persistent grants both in block back and block front. So uh, in the conclusion of the slides, I'll talk a little bit more about why we did that. So um, this shows actually the overhead for that. We, we know or we believe, as Boris was saying, you don't know anything until you properly measured it, um, that there is some sort of contention on the grant table. And if we were actually doing concurrent AO and having many domains hammering them zero with AO requests, this, this would probably not grow linearly. It would probably go worse a lot more than, than just that because of, of locking issues. But we haven't measured that just yet. So what happens when you actually have persistent grants in this case? So that's what I noticed when I actually had persistent grants. Those two lines as before that were the lines for, for the grant map and the grant map actually dropped down. So they started to be executed really, really fast, even for bigger block sizes. But the time that is spent copying the data from the persistently granted pages were, uh, was actually pretty high. Now, I know it would be better if I actually have a, a total line to show this. But the sum of these bottom lines is actually not higher than that, it's lower. Which means the persistent grant for this use case was actually worse. So for aggregate throughput, the persistent grant is, is good because we eliminate the, conta the contention on the, on the grant table, or we believe we're doing that. It is faster. Roger, when he implemented that, he measured this. Um, also for the user space alternative, so this is for block back, the persistent grants also help because the current way we're doing grand mapping and mapping on the grand device is actually slow. Again, something we believe. I haven't effectively measured that just yet. So for user space alternatives, the persistent grant is, is very good. Now, there might be other things we can do there. And I, I'm going to go to that later. Uh, so just to summarize, this, I just did this measurement because this was just something very recent. You got upstream to 3.11, and I wanted to, to examine that in, in this fashion. So what I observed is that. Um, with the, with the persistent grants, we, we were going to do less flushing because we're not doing uh, as many end mapping. And um, we, we are believed to have less contention in the grant tables. So the, in concurrent AO, is probably better. But the, the problem I see is that currently, block front will always use the persistently granted pages, even if it hasn't negotiated persistent grants with block back. So it will always copy. So, Ideally, it should support both data paths. I already have a chance to talk to Roger, and he agrees with me, and this is probably something we're going to be changing soon. So um, um, 
we, we believe it would be better if administrator could, could decide which one of these is, oh, in my deployment, I'm going to use persistent grants, or I'm not. It depends on the particular case. So there are a number of things um, we can do for, uh, for improving here. So this is the time where we have to start thinking and experimenting with things, and people who have ideas should step forward and, and get involved. Now, all of these SSDs and, and, and VMEs and whatever, it's pretty new technology. And, well, as I showed you, the block tap stuff we're using, that's probably still from before SSDs. <laughs> and um, that there are many new aspects changing in storage technology very, very fast. And for the next years, we anticipate to be doing uh, maybe a million IOPS with a single stream, so devices responding in one microsecond. And we cannot afford to be spending several dozens of microseconds in gram mapping or mapping. The, we're not really getting them, the, the cores are not really getting that faster. We need to find new ways of doing that. So some of the ideas that I've been discussing, there's a persistent grant. I'm not going to go in detail through all of them, I'm just going to mention some, and we can discuss that later. There's a persistent grant that we're just talking about. So we know gram mapping and mapping is expensive, we know there's some contention tables, this is a way of helping that. Another thing that got implemented in 3.11, which I believe is very, very helpful, is indirect AO. So uh, up to three, up to three ten something, we could only uh, each each request that would be put in the ring between block front and block back could be at most forty four k. So the request structure only had uh, eleven segments for pages, and we could not address more than that. So if you issued a larger request, it would get split up. Uh, that also limited the total amount of data you could have in flight <coughs> because the ring only has thirty two slots. So unless you're using multi page ring or doing some other thing like that you would be very limited on the amount of requests you can put through. So Interactive will fix that by having the, um, the, the one segment pointing to a page full of segments for the request. You can have very large requests per ring entry. So uh, Malcolm in, in our sensor engineering team also proposed something where we can avoid doing TLB flushes if we hadn't touched the pages and we realized that in the storage data path we don't really look at the data. So we still do the mapping, but if you don't access data, we don't need to force a TLB flush. Um, David here has been talking about uh, some other ideas for, uh, for the use of space alternatives, in which we introduce a, a page fault handler, or we don't really need to, to, to gram map in the user space and the kernel, which is what's happening now. There are other ideas, such as uh, using separate rings for requests and responses. So imagine if the guest has one ring for putting the requests in and the backend could put the responses in a separate ring. So you would facilitate, for example, to control how many outstanding requests you have. So right now we can only have at most 30 requests because you consume the whole ring and then you need the slots to put the responses in. And if you had different requests, you could have different threads in, the, in your control domain, your driver domain, just coordinating, saying we're not going to pick up more than a thousand requests altogether so they could just consume the ring slowly. Or if there is only one VM and you have enough memory for you, you could just consume the, 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 the request ring many times and just keep placing requests. You have separate space to put the, the, the responses. This could also possibly help with some caching issues. Um, if you are following what's happening at the block layer, there are some people working on a, a multi-queue approach, which is basically they realize that in big NUMA machines, you still have one single request queue per, per device driver. So you put the request in there, and if the request is coming from, from a CPU in a different node, there, there is a very high cost of doing remote access. And this is, again, a very big penalty for, for very fast uh, storage drivers. So, so the, the concept of having software request queues and, and need for um, algorithms like CFQ are, are, are being rethinked. And we should rethink that too. How, how are we going to adapt to these new changes? This is probably coming at 3.12, I think. And that's it. I think it was just about on time. So thank you, and I'll take some questions. Any questions? Have you answered everything up front? <laughs> I, I think people just want to go to the pub now. Yeah. Well, yeah. they are waiting for you the all whisk. Look, you all look a little tired, like me. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're waiting for the whiskey raffle. Yeah. So, no questions? Okay. Thank you.